Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault. Tonight, Ontario steps up its COVID fight in long-term care homes. We will overturn every rock, every boulder. But with the death toll rising dramatically, what took so long? Nobody's doing anything. They just like, leave people died. And CBC News learns Ontario quietly stopped inspections and long-term care before the pandemic. I'm Andrew Chang. Also tonight, the question on everyone's mind. When things are going to get back to normal. The complicated answer and what Canada can learn from others who've tried to lift lockdowns. A dire global economic forecast, the worst since the Great Depression. Our financial experts on how to weather the storm. And the small, simple signs reminding all of us we're in this together. It brings, like, hope. Like a little more hope. This is The National. Today, Canada recorded its highest daily death toll yet in this pandemic. At least 147 more lives claimed by COVID-19. And we know there is one group in particular being hit hard. Residents of long-term care and seniors' homes where the virus is on the loose. Now, in a scramble to save lives and with more than 1,200 long-term care workers sick, Today, a plea from Quebec's Premier for anyone with health care experience to come forward and to help. And in Ontario today, a new emergency order prohibiting long-term care employees from working in more than one home. In that province alone, at least 114 long-term care facilities are battling outbreaks. And as Ellen Morrow shows us, at the centre of each one are sick, scared seniors and families fearing the worst. This grim ritual has played out at least 27 times during the outbreak at Eatonville Care Centre. Outside, families do what they can to comfort, but with death tolls at long-term care homes continuing to rise, so are frustrations with the system itself. Do you see anybody from the ministry? The only people we see is you guys. Hélène Bordage's son's father lives in the home. Why don't they bring the army or do something? This is the, 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 the tip of the highs everywhere in, in Ontario and in Quebec and in, in Canada. This problem with the long-term facility and they just let it go. Today, Premier Doug Ford announced a new effort to stop the deaths. We must redeploy every available resources to our long-term care homes right now. It is absolutely critical. That means hospital staff will be sent in to help at long-term care facilities and care workers will no longer be allowed to work in multiple homes. No question it should have happened sooner. Still, this epidemiologist applauds the move. Within our acute care hospitals, we have all of this expertise and I think distributing that expertise on a, on a temporary basis but on an urgent basis to long-term care homes could save lives. But action now is too late for Darren Bruff. I understand my father was old and he was going to die and you know, but it wasn't supposed to go like this. His father Bill died at Eatonville before Bruff could say goodbye. Told too late, he says that his father was fading. I finally get in, my father's on his last breath, literally dead, lying in his bed. Bruff says better staffing would have meant someone could have called him sooner. So now they're being sent around all these different places. They need to hire these people full time, pay them benefits, so they're in one place. A sentiment the province now seems to have heard after weeks of loss. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Toronto. There is no doubt this virus has put incredible strain on long-term care facilities, but questions are also being raised about what kind of shape they were in before this pandemic. David Common with what we've learned about inspections at Ontario facilities. With the death toll mounting in Ontario's care homes, a key question is were they prepared? Surprise and detailed inspections like this one previously recorded by our hidden cameras exist to ensure homes are running safely. But CBC News dug through government reports, finding those annual inspections have all but disappeared for more than a year. Pinecrest, where at least 29 had died by this morning, last faced a resident quality inspection in June of 2018. Eatonville, with at least 27 dead, last checked in September 2017. 
Seven Oaks, 22 dead, June 2018. Anson Place, 19 dead, June 2017. It's a long list and reveals the Ford government has quietly stopped these detailed checks. It's incredibly frustrating to hear this. There ought to be inspections of long-term care homes, just as there are of schools and of daycares. But that, she claims, is not what the largely for-profit companies running most Ontario homes want. They have lobbied routinely for deregulation of long-term care homes, a reduction in the number of standards, a reduction in the unannounced inspections. And they have political connections. The chair of Chartwell, one of the largest companies, is Mike Harris, former Ontario Premier, who also cut the inspections before they were later reinstated. We will overturn every rock, every boulder, if that's what it takes to protect their most vulnerable. The Ontario government says every home is inspected at least once a year, but after complaints, critical incidents, and reports of serious harm. Critics point out the home knows the inspectors are coming and the inspection is less detailed. That's very upsetting. For those with parents in care, it's yet another concern. I think that's something that everybody should be aware of because it is, it is very scary. Her mother lives here. After years of facing yearly quality inspections, the last was 18 months ago. David Common, CBC News, Toronto. Now's a good time to bring in someone who understands the scope of this problem very well. Dr. Samir Sinha, the Director of Geriatrics at Sinai Health System in Toronto. And, and Dr. Sinha, there are a lot of Canadians out there who are just wondering, gosh, I mean, what do I do at this point? Is, is there some way that I can pitch in to help what? It's scary right now, and, and every family out there is quite anxious because they're worried about their loved ones. They wonder if their home might be next or if their loved one might catch COVID. And so really what I say is, you know, know that the governments are actually following the latest evidence that's just come out federally. Um, governments are taking action and they're doing the best they can, and, and the care workers are doing the best they can. But reach out to the home. Ask them how they're doing. Ask them potentially what you might be able to do for the staff to support them and make them feel supported. But most importantly, if you have a loved one in care, you know, reach out to them. If you're anxious, they're anxious too. You know, give them a call, a video chat, um, and see what you could do to maybe make them a little less anxious as well right now. Okay, some good advice there. Dr. Sinha, thanks so much for your time. Thanks, Andrew. Every single outbreak at a long-term care facility, one is already too many, is tragic and terrifying. But Canada's battle against the pandemic has some encouraging signs. So this is the rate of new cases emerging each day. The curve Canadians have been working so hard to flatten, and it is. So far, we've been dancing at or under a high of new cases hit about 10 days ago, but that is still more than 1,000 new cases a day. And today's awful toll is a reminder the pace of new deaths isn't slowing. As David Cochran shows us, neither Ottawa nor the provinces seem eager to jeopardize whatever success we do have. It's the big question. I know that everyone is very interested to know when things are going to get back to normal. For which there is no definitive answer. The reality is um, it is going to be uh, weeks still. With massive uncertainty everywhere in Canada. You tell me how long the pandemic will last, I'll tell you how long. I don't know. It is really premature to even think about that just at the moment. If we had a dollar for every time Heather and I were asked this question, those would be some of the few dollars moving in an economy largely locked down to essential services. Saskatchewan says it may soon release a plan to reopen its economy, but warns even with a plan, it won't happen quickly. There is no magic switch that we can flip that sends everything back to normal overnight. There have been some exemptions beyond core essential work in sectors like construction, but nationally there are still too many cases. And with each province on its own epidemic curve, there are still too many hot spots, too much uncertainty for serious talk about an economic return to normal. There's no rule book on this. There's not a book that I can pull off the shelf that tells me how do I deal with a pandemic. Even the premier who boasted that Ontario was open for business is determined to keep it closed. I'm not going to jeopardize people's health to open up the floodgates. So the gates stay closed for now, and when they do finally open, it will be done slowly, with caution, and coordinating as much as possible with the provinces. 
we will have to do it in phases. We will have to remain vigilant until such a point as a vaccine against COVID-19 is found. A vaccine would allow for definitive answers, but that is still, at best, months away. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. The World Health Organization just published its own answer for when countries should return to normal and what normal should look like. But as Thomas Daigle shows us, some countries are already pressing ahead despite the risks. The morning commute, usually something so unremarkable, but now a sign of better days. Today, Spain allowed construction workers back on the job as police checked proof of employment to allow motorists through. In hard-hit Italy, early signs of restrictions easing off. Some stores were allowed to reopen, including this Rome baby shop. We have to work. We have bills to pay, we have rents to pay, we have wages to pay. Other European countries are resisting pressure. France's lockdown set to drag on until May. And Britain hasn't yet flattened its curve. So this wedding photographer remains stuck at home. Sort of soul searching and trying to find a route through um, where perhaps it feels quite unfair. The WHO tonight releasing new guidelines for countries to consider before lifting restrictions. Chief among them, ensuring COVID-19 transmission is under control with only sporadic cases or clusters. But crucially, testing and tracing capacity to confirm all suspected cases within 24 hours not just the serious ones, so they can be quickly isolated. Plus, minimizing the threat in high-risk settings, including nursing homes. There are things that need to be done. You can't replace lockdown with nothing. The WHO is also urging countries to monitor and potentially quarantine incoming travelers, demanding workplaces be adapted to allow for physical distancing and asking everyone to keep it up. Canada doesn't meet the bar yet. We really can't afford uh, to be uh, only reacting. We have to be much more proactive and uh, we don't have any excuses now. Of all the countries starting to ease constraints, it's unclear how many are really ready and how many will face a second wave for opening up too soon. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. Now, one strategy that some countries are considering is easing restrictions for people who've already had COVID-19. Christine Birak has that story. Some health experts are debating the idea of giving an immunity passport to those who've recovered from COVID-19, a document that could release people from physical isolation and return to their jobs. The question is, would it work? There's at least a reasonable hope that people who get the infection and recover should be protected for a period of time, but that's something that's going to be looked at really closely. Personal trainer Chad Warren was knocked right off his feet by the virus in late March. Now he wants to know if he has immunity. I'm not one to sit around much, so I'm looking forward to getting back to work for sure. Antibody testing uses droplets of blood to try and figure out who might be immune. If the test is sensitive and if the test is specific, and those are big ifs because that we know that some of these tests are not working as well as we'd like. But if that test is working the way it should, that will tell you you have antibodies to the virus. Which means you'll know if you had the virus or not. But experts say those rapid tests can't tell you how many antibodies your immune system made in response. And that's important because immunity often depends on having a high concentration of a specific antibody called IgG in your blood. Tanya Watts researches long-term immunity. We can't expect a large amount of the population to be immune for some time. So it's really a question of how do we judge when self-isolation ends. I don't think it can, can be based on the immune passport yet. We're not completely sure of anything with this thing. And it's, it's all speculative because it hasn't been around that long. And scientists are moving quickly to find a key that can open the door on lockdowns as quickly and safely as possible. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Now, of course, getting people back to work is key to fighting the devastating economic impact of COVID-19. A bleak report from the International Monetary Fund today says the global economy will contract by 3% this year, with highly developed economies like Canada's shrinking by more than 6%. That's $9 trillion off the global economy. They think it could be the worst downturn since the Great Depression. 
So let's bring in senior business correspondent Peter Armstrong. Peter, have we ever even seen anything remotely like this? No, I mean, you mentioned the Great Depression. I mean, they're even saying this is much worse than the 2008 financial crisis. And think about that. That was 10 years ago, and we still feel its impact. And back then, global GDP fell by just 1%. This is already forecast to be three times as bad. And the numbers, I mean, the numbers are just shocking. Italy's GDP will fall 9%, 5.9% in the U.S. You mentioned 6.2% here. But remember, every time somebody tries to forecast this out, they, they come up with something, we gasp at how terrible it is, then the data come in, and they're often much, much worse. So then is there any good news? I mean, the IMF was also talking about a, a recovery with some pretty positive projections. Indeed, but that it's going to take us a while to get there. The global GDP will bounce back like 5.8%. And Canada's economy will grow by more than four. The U.S. will see like 4.7 percent growth. But that's not just a few months away. We're looking at the end of 2021. So we need to brace for a long, potentially slow recovery. And that means our policies will have to remain flexible throughout. All right. Thanks very much for this. And uh, Peter will join us a little later in the program, along with personal finance expert Preet Banerjee, to answer your questions about your money during the pandemic. For good reason. A lot of the focus right now is on doctors and nurses, but there is another type of frontline healthcare worker dealing face to face with patients who would normally be seen by doctors. Rosa Marcatelli shows us how they are often left to their own devices. My first name is K Y R O L L O S. Toronto pharmacist Carolos Massey barely has time for a quick interview. Okay, tell him I'm going to call him. Uh, sorry, there's a patient at the door. He's overwhelmed with patients who want to avoid medical clinics and the ER or want to see someone face to face in a time when some physicians are doing assessments over the phone or online. Me personally having to do everything from binging, binging up a patient that opened up his head and started bleeding and didn't want to go to a merge or all the way to talking down someone from committing suicide. He says he'd normally refer those cases to emergency rooms since pharmacists aren't typically trained to do those things. But he felt he had no choice and used the extra training he has to help. And that's just me. I'm, my colleagues have plenty of stories. Other pharmacies are losing staff to quarantine or fear and struggling to get the medications they need to fill prescriptions. And it's not just in big cities. Rural pharmacist Tamara Awada has faced difficulties before. Over the last few years, her community was hit by a tornado, flood, and now the pandemic. She's dealing with extra work and extra costs, like having to buy safety equipment. But this is the reality. And we can get uh, through this together. These University of Waterloo students are trying to help. So far, they've collected 13,000 pairs of gloves and 400 face shields for pharmacists in their area. We're here as pharmacy students fighting against COVID-19. Some provinces, like Alberta and New Brunswick, have now ordered personal protective equipment for pharmacists and plan to distribute them in the coming days. That's what needs to happen across the country, says this academic. So when it comes to planning for PPE or childcare services or COVID testing, in many cases, pharmacists are actually not included. Still, many pharmacists say they're willing to take more on, and it looks like they'll need to. Some provinces, like Ontario and Newfoundland, are now easing regulations around renewing and transferring certain types of prescriptions without a doctor's approval to help ease the strain on the health care system. Rosa Marcatelli, CBC News, Calgary. Nova Scotia's chief medical officer announced 43 new cases today, including an additional 13 at the Northwood long-term care home in Halifax. We continue to see a lot of, of cases, but that's because they're doing a lot of testing. All except one have mild illness or some are even asymptomatic. That brings the total number of cases connected to the facility to 47. All affected residents have been transferred to a separate floor where they will receive specialized treatment. Meanwhile, some reassurance for residents of Newfoundland and Labrador today. After fears the province's food supply was at risk, Ocean X, which delivers about half of all freight to the province, had said that shipments to the island could be reduced due to the pandemic. But Crown Corporation Marine Atlantic says it can fill any gap that Ocean X may leave behind. Although across the city property crime is down, there was an increase in commercial break and enters ever since physical distancing measures have started. Vancouver police say 40 people have been arrested over the last few weeks after a surge in break-ins at businesses in the city. Officers have been increasing patrols around shuttered stores, but owners are being urged to do their part by hiding merchandise, upgrading locks, 
and keeping their businesses well lit. And just when you thought it couldn't possibly get any worse in the United States, today, COVID-related deaths passed 25,000, and the number in New York City alone was revised to more than 10,000. So that now includes 3,700 deaths of people who were presumed to have the disease but never tested. Tonight, President Donald Trump was again defensive about how he has handled the crisis. And as Paul Hunter tells us, then he went on the offensive. In the middle of a health crisis that has rocked the planet, tonight Donald Trump took aim at the World Health Organization. Today I'm instructing my administration to halt funding of the World Health Organization. Said World Trump, the WHO has mismanaged the crisis and went easy on China where the virus began, even though until recently, Trump himself praised China for its response on this and had himself played down the threat of the virus. Still, tonight, Trump put hundreds of millions of dollars of U.S. funding for the WHO on hold while it evaluates next steps. We have deep concerns whether America's generosity has been put to the best use possible. Meanwhile, as COVID deaths continue to climb in America, anger in places over the continuing shutdown of the economy as a means to slow the spread of the virus. These demonstrators in North Carolina pressing today for a reopening now. It's scary and our livelihoods are at stake. The plans to reopen the country are close to being finalized. Trump tonight on that, he authorizes states to choose for themselves when to reopen, suggesting he expects it to begin soon. It's going to be very, very close, maybe even before the date of May 1st. Most experts have suggested that's too soon. Today, various governors underlined they'll rely on those experts, not the president. It's going to be gradual, incremental. We're going to use data, we're going to use science. Science, where public health, not politics, uh, must be the guide. Trump took heat all day for suggesting last night he has the ultimate power on all of it. Tonight, taking a slightly different tack, suggesting if states decide to reopen too soon, he'd overrule them. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Barack Obama has endorsed his former vice president, Joe Biden, in this year's U.S. presidential election. He also has some reassuring words for Americans in this moment. As we all manage our way through a pandemic unlike anything we've seen in a century, Michelle and I hope that you and your families are safe and well. If you've lost somebody to this virus, or if someone in your life is sick, or if you're one of the millions suffering economic hardship, please know that you're in our prayers. Please know that you're not alone. Because now's the time Obama also thanked frontline workers and public officials for their efforts. Should people face fines or criminal charges for spreading misinformation about the coronavirus? If people are out there online promoting disinformation, they have to be held accountable. Up next, how governments are grappling with bad actors online and how you can respond to people sharing conspiracy theories. Your issues, our experts. Our questions panel focuses on your finances tonight. The more and more it comes in, the better. Plus, the Second World War vet who's raised millions of dollars from around the world by going for a walk. We're back in two. COVID-19 isn't just deadly, it has contaminated the world with uncertainty in an already divided time. Most Americans now consider it a bigger threat than terrorism or the spread of nuclear weapons. And at the same time, about a third believe a debunked theory that COVID-19 was cooked up in a lab. And there is far more bizarre misinformation out there. So it is hard enough to battle a pandemic without conspiracy theorists opening a second front. Katie Nicholson looks at how countries around the world are pushing back. No black people will die from corona. Never. Spreading falsehoods like that could get you jail time in Thailand. And claiming green tea could prevent coronavirus is illegal in South Africa and Singapore. In the UK, this MP is calling for new laws to protect the public from bad pandemic information. I think we should look at creating offences, sharing 
for, for knowingly and maliciously sharing disinformation about coronavirus. Oh, you can trust me. The British government has started a rapid response unit to take down COVID misinformation as soon as it goes up and has produced PSAs like this one. Damien Collins himself launched this website, Infotagion, to hit back at bad COVID info with the cold hard facts. The European Union launched a similar effort in March. It's a massive wave breathing on the ground of uncertainty, anxiety and the rapidly changing news cycle. But for the time being in Canada, there's no legal blowback for spreading fake COVID information like, say, this video claiming these ingredients can treat the virus. And so far, no national plan to stop it. That's despite the fact the government acknowledges it's a problem. During a, a public health crisis, a global pandemic, access to reliable public health information, frankly, uh, is essential to combating the virus. At this point, we all have to pick up and we cannot be uh, complacent about the threat of disinformation. The NDP says now is the time to consider using the power of the courts. If people are out there online promoting disinformation, they have to be held accountable. These are the extraordinary steps that have to be taken in the face of a pandemic. Health Canada is taking action on false medical claims, but the government says that actual laws on spreading misinformation while under discussion will likely have to wait until after the pandemic when Parliament resumes its normal business. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Toronto. We know misinformation always spreads in times of fear, but while it's easy to dismiss total strangers, it is trickier when bogus information comes from friends and family. So we put together a bit of a guide on how to respond without burning bridges. So what do you do when this happens? A loved one, let's say it's your dad drops into the family group chat with something he thinks is real. It's something about China manufacturing the coronavirus. There's a link to a site you've never heard of with a message calling it scary stuff. So what do you do with this? Do you ignore it? Do you call him out saying how ridiculous you think this is? If you do that to your dad, you've actually shamed him. My name is Claire Wardle and I'm the US director of First Draft and we are a nonprofit that we help people navigate the challenges of misinformation online. What happens is that your dad doubles down on his view and he dismisses what you're saying. Use language that's empathetic and to say we're all in this together and rather than you're wrong, I'm right, here are the facts because that does not work. So hold back on all that reactive talk. Maybe try something like this. Yeah, these are scary times. We're all a bit afraid, but let's be careful. What you're sharing is inaccurate and it feeds into that fear we all feel everybody's like anxiety is so heightened right now people are sharing this stuff not for any malicious reasons but because they're scared too sending more context could also be a good move but don't drown them in evidence maybe send an article from a legitimate source quoting credible scientists on why the virus wasn't manufactured conspiracies can be just as infectious just as dangerous as a virus so you have to guard against them it's very easy to just mute your crazy high school friend on Facebook or to leave a WhatsApp group where people are sharing false information. But right now, I actually think there's kind of a responsibility on all of us to help people understand that sharing that kind of information is increasing the level of pollution. Okay, our nightly panel answering your questions is coming up next. Tonight, it's all about your finances. And here's the question we're going to start with. When will the government be topping up salaries for employees who've had their hours cut? But first, our latest COVID-19 how-to guide. What's the best way to clean something? When it comes to disinfecting hard surfaces, we've got options. But which is best? Let's start with bleach. Up to a one in 10 solution. I use usually two tablespoons in a you know 750 milliliter bottle of uh, water. And that's a fairly weak solution, so it usually isn't too damaging, but it just does still smell like bleach. So for a smaller 360 ml bottle like this, one tablespoon will do. And I prefer to use the stream on the bottle instead of the spray because you don't want to be inhaling the bleach. Disinfectant wipes work well too, but you just have to make sure to let the surface air dry because the contact time is important. But here's something that doesn't necessarily work. The concern is that the household vinegar acetic acid probably isn't strong enough um, to rely on against the virus, whereas bleach is actually quite reliable. And how about good old soap and water? Well, it's good for cleaning the countertop before you disinfect, but on a hard surface like this, not as reliable at killing the virus on its own.
Hey, welcome back. Time for your COVID-19 questions. With the IMF warning, we could see an economic downturn not seen since the Great Depression. Many Canadians are worried about their money. So tonight, we focus on finances, paying the rent, paying the mortgage, whatever it may be. Joining me, personal finance expert Preet Banerjee and, once again, our national business correspondent, Peter Armstrong. Hello, gentlemen, to you. Peter, we've got lots of questions to get through. Let's start with you. Here's one uh, coming your way. When will the government be topping up salaries for employees who've had their hours cut? There are people who've lost the majority of their income, but not down to zero. So I gather not eligible for the CERB. Right. And, you know, the, what we're asking there is, can you tell me when soon is? We know <laughs> the government has said they're going to address gig workers, and that, that's this. Uh, they are hoping the government to get that in place this week. But there's an awful lot on their plate. Uh, Chris Hall and, and David Cochran from our Parliamentary Bureau have both said they're trying to get this done. They're trying to get it done this week. They recognize it's a problem. They've been really flexible in how they address a lot of this. This is one of those places they need to get some more traction. They need to continue to be flexible going forward. Okay, stay tuned. More details to come. Preet, uh, will there be any funds for people like students who didn't earn income last year but who now can't find a job? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and similarly, I think there will be an expansion, as Peter alluded to, with the CERB program. But the government did announce an expansion of the Canada Summer Jobs Program, which allows employers to get fairly lucrative uh, subsidies up to 100% of the provincial or territorial minimum wages. And this is not just for students. It's for anyone 15 to 30. Uh, they've made some extensions in terms of the application period. So you could take a look at the job bank to see if you could see any of those jobs listed. Peter, another uh, group feeling the crunch. Will there be nationwide relief for renters? If so, when? Look, this is probably the question I get asked the most, and, and it's, it's important both for individuals and small businesses. It's the last big fixed price that fixed sort of expenditure that, that the businesses have, uh, and we don't know anything from a national perspective, and all of the provinces are really doing it sort of individually, and it's a bit of a patchwork, so it depends on where you are. And I think in this and in everything else we're talking about here, the best thing you can do if you're worried about this is get informed. Reach out to rental advocacy groups. Talk to your municipal councillor. Talk to your MPP and your MP. Find out what is available to you, because some provinces do have sort of rent subsidies and one-time payments, but they really do depend on where you are, and they depend specifically. This isn't a nationwide thing or a province-wide thing. It's a really regional thing. Right. But I guess, Preet, let's not forget the other side of the coin, also feeling the pressure here. Here's another question. What's fair for small-scale landlords to expect from tenants who can't pay full rent? Also, if I incur debt, is it reasonable for me to roll that into what my tenant owes me in the future? That's a great question. A lot of small-scale landlords are facing situations like this right now. And what I would say is, you know, be proactive. Just like we're asking people who think that they may not be able to pay to be proactive and contact the people that they owe money to, I think landlords should also reach out and see if some of their tenants need help. And I think spreading out the pain, meaning maybe there's a, a rental reduction for a short period of time in exchange for partly paying for the increased costs that are borne by the landlord is something to consider. So have a talk, communicate, see if you can work out a plan. We're all in this together. Right. Communication and compromise. Uh, two good points there. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Really appreciate your time here. Thank you. So, as we've mentioned, we will be asking your questions about COVID-19 every night, so send them our way. You can message us directly on Instagram at CBC the National, or you can send us an email at covid at cbc.ca. Just be sure to put the National in the subject line. Next on the National, four students, one laptop. I am concerned about their learning. We want their learning not to be affected. It's the reality for families across the country as students figure out how to learn from home. Next, how some students are getting the equipment they finally need. But first, as COVID-19 changes the way we live, we are turning over parts of our program each night to hear from you and your new normal. Tonight, meet Ty, who has suddenly found himself deemed an essential worker. My name is Ty Simpson. Uh, I'm a worker at a large retail store in Bowmanville, Ontario. I have been working throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. Each day it seems that things have progressed past a point that seemed unimaginable a few days prior. Yet, when I'm at work, I interact with 
so many people on a daily basis who are treating this as if it's uh, no big deal still. And it keeps me up at night thinking that there are people like this who are coming out and making frivolous purchases and bringing their family members along because they want to get out of the house. When you do that, you directly increase the risk that me or someone like me will um, contract the virus. I also worry that by continuing to work, I put at risk the others in my household. What I would most like to say to all Canadians is that unless it is absolutely essential, please stay at home. Welcome back. Nearly a month since the pandemic closed schools across Canada, the prospect of reopening seems more remote all the time. Just to confirm, uh, students will not be going back on May the 4th. That does not mean the, the year is cancelled. Today, Ontario cancelled its back-to-school plan for next month. Quebec's premier recently mused about reopening ahead of May 4th, then backed down over safety concerns. But learning from home is far from ideal. Many families simply lack computer equipment or reliable internet access. Chris Glover looks at efforts to clear those hurdles and salvage the school year. <laughs> Ahmed Al Shantut says he's turning from dad to diplomat, managing his boy's learning on one family laptop. I am concerned about their learning. We want their learning not to be affected by the situation. A recent immigrant, he struggles to pay rent, let alone purchase a laptop for each child. His kids are on a list to receive equipment like some 15,000 others in this Toronto area school board. Photos provided by boards show a massive mobilization effort underway across the country to collect, tag, and distribute devices to kids in need. I've reached you in Pickering today, right? Yes, Pickering, rural, rural Pickering to be exact. Rosette Ocala says she's paid hundreds of dollars in data overage fees for her 12-year-old's e-learning. He connects using her phone's hotspot. She says the pandemic is spotlighting rural Canada's spotty internet access. It's not even a matter of privilege or a matter of, you know, a want. This is a need. Schools are shipping internet-enabled devices. In Toronto, thousands of iPads will go out already connected. We wish we could do this immediately. We wish we could have it done yesterday. But because we will be serving approximately 29,000 families, uh, it just will take time. Private businesses are helping. This warehouse packed with 1,000 laptops to be donated to students. We are part of this community. We can't keep the government doing all the efforts alone. We all in this together. One of these devices may very well end up with the Al Shantuts. So if that lasts, this means my first kid will graduate from high school during this time. This is why we really need to make sure uh, remote learning will not be affected. Every board's top priority is equipping grade 12 students in danger of losing their final year of high school. Chris Glover, CBC News, Toronto. And next on The National, looking for hope in all the right places. It brings, like, hope, like a little more hope to um, your neighborhood. A neighborhood effort to stay connected while isolating. But first, tomorrow, as Canada marks a month of shutdowns and self-isolation, join Ian Hennemansing and Heather Hiscox for a two-hour special town hall. Ian and Heather will be fielding your questions and stories along with Chief Public Health Officer Dr. Teresa Tam and other special guests. So tune in tomorrow on CBC Television, CBC News Network and CBC Gem at the time right there on your screen. She was careful to keep her distance, didn't even get out of her car, but a Quebec photographer managed to capture this unique moment in history. For 10 days, she drove around taking pictures of her city. Hundreds of families took part, some of them to shake up the monotony of self-isolation, others to send a message of hope, or just to show gratitude and support for their community. Just one example of people creating something positive right now. Tonight, Nick Purden takes us to a Toronto neighborhood where each day people decorate their windows for others to discover. Look, some clouds! Order and rainbow, order! 
you can go out for a walk in your neighborhood and then you can just look around for houses that you can spot. It brings like hope, like a little more hope to um, your neighborhood and, and yeah. That's Ruby, she's 10. <laughs> and she's out hunting for clouds, which is today's theme in the front window scavenger hunt, as the neighbors around here call it. Ruby's mom, Michelle Beaton, is the organizer. I guess I would consider myself a glass half full type person. I have two kids and so if I'm sad, they know. And I don't want them to feel sad, so I have to keep positive. <laughs> now at first it was just one of those ideas to get her kids to do something. Then it took off. Now lots of people in the neighborhood decorate their windows. And Ruby will tell you that the best part checking out what other people have done. Like it shows that people care and like they're showing you that they're they're fighting. Yeah. Like yeah. Ruby's neighbor Jennifer Katz and her kids. We get a lot of people walking by and laughing and enjoying it and that gives us some pleasure even though we can't hang out with our neighbors. It's like we've brought them a smile. Who made these? Did you make those? Which one neighbor probably needs this project more than most. Do we want to go find some other clouds and some other windows? Sam okay. Gosby is a nurse working through the COVID pandemic at the local hospital. Ready? Okay. And every day when she gets home, she does the scavenger hunt with her daughter, Thea. Being a nurse, I, it's very stressful being on the front line. Um, when I come home and I get to spend time with my daughter. We'll go this way. It really makes me feel so happy that we have such a positive community and, and there's positivity in such a time that there's so much fear and concern. Do you see any clouds? I yeah. see it. I see it. You see it? Do you want mommy to lift you up? Lots is likely going to change after COVID-19, but Sam hopes some good might come from the I'm pandemic. Fine. Good job. What I hope and I feel like this community is doing is we're, is we're getting stronger, we're not getting weaker, and we're not getting scared. We're, we're getting, we're pulling together. So when this is all done, I think it's going to be really awesome because like? our community is just pulling together and not, not being scared. And swing by Ruby's house and you see that sentiment loud and clear. We all have our own part in keeping each other safe by staying home. And we all need to help in, in a way. And so we're all in this together. You know, maybe Ruby's banner is what we need to fly over the whole country right now. Nick Purden, CBC News, Toronto. Another act of community in our moment, this one global. When Captain Tom, a Second World War vet, set out to raise money while people from around the world showed up to donate. His story, next. So Captain Tom Moore here wanted to walk a hundred lengths of his backyard garden before he turns 100 years old later this month. His goal was to raise some money for England's healthcare system. Well, he hoped to raise a thousand pounds or so, but by the end of the first 24 hours, he'd already raised over 70,000 and he just kept going. And now that number just keeps climbing and that is our moment. We might get a thousand, and we seem to have got a little bit better than that. And, and, and it's still rising, still coming in. And we're hoping more, the more and more it comes in, the better. That I shall continue up, up and down here after my birthday. When I was in the hospital with my hip and then with my head, the service I got from those people was absolutely unbelievable at all times they're so good so cheerful so so friendly virtuous favors are brave and that's what they are they're brave i'll keep on going whilst people are still contributing to the national health service so, so, so okay so let me get this straight he, he thinks he can raise about a thousand pounds they set the goal a little bit higher than that. And did you guys see that number? So almost four million pounds and counting, that's wild. Yeah, good for him. You know, we, we often talk about we want the moment to be Canadian, but we're all having this global experience and this might as well be Canadian. He raised money for 
rest and recuperation rooms, for well-being packs uh, for, the, for the nurses and for the doctors and devices so patients could communicate. It is amazing. And that is a national for Tuesday, April the 14th. Good night. Good night.